everyone. We've added this note to the beginning of all of our original episodes of the podcast to let you know of a few changes that have happened around here and hopefully avoid any confusion for you as listeners. When we began this podcast, it was called Starseed Survival Guide, and most people called me, your host, by my birth name, Erin. Throughout the first 22 episodes, you'll hear me introduce myself as Erin, hear others refer to me as Erin, and hear many references to the name of the show being Starseed Survival Guide. In 2018, more and more folks began calling us Yaya, and in March of 2020, we changed the name of this podcast to Earthside Survival Guide to more accurately reflect our intentions for the show. For a little more of the full story of what these changes mean to us, please check out episode 23, a temple talk where we reflect on where we've been, where we are now, and where we're going. We thank you for your patience during this transition, for listening and sharing this journey with us, and most importantly, for allowing us to continue to grow and evolve. Blessings. And as I call in the east, I walk into the stream, and as I call in the south, I bring water to my mouth. And as I call in the west, the creek swallows my chest. And as I call in the north, I am swallowed by her source. Greetings, starseeds, and welcome to the Starseed Survival Guide podcast. I'll be your host, Erin Rivera Merriman, and I'm honored to facilitate a place for us to virtually gather to be seated, activated, and germinated by the infinite well of galactic and terrestrial wisdom that is available to all in every moment. Thank you for hearing the call, for remembering that there is so very much more to life and showing up to explore the secret, esoteric, mystical, and unorthodox pathways to liberation are and forever will be open to you and all who seek them with sincerity. We welcome and hail to the guardians and the gatekeepers who dwell eternally in the liminal realms. We humbly beseech your assistance today in opening these portals between the dimensions so that those who have tuned in with this transmission may find themselves able to listen from a deeper place and receive the hybrid medicine and restructuring that the helper spirits who called this broadcast into being so generously provide. May you as sacred listeners hear what you need to hear and discard anything that is not of value to your own stated intentions for your life and the fulfillment of your soul's purpose in the most enjoyable, most beautiful possible way. Starseed Survival Guide is a listener-supported program and we hope that if you find value in the experience we share here today, that you might consider offering support by visiting us online at www.activeculturefamily.com and making a purchase or donation. Many blessings to you on your journey and we hope you enjoy the show. Hello everyone, it's me, Erin, and I'm here today with Leah Song, one half of the duo at the front of the musical activist band Rising Appalachia. Rising Appalachia brings to the stage a collection of sounds, stories, and songs steeped in tradition and devoted to world culture. Intertwining a deep reverence for folk music and a passion for justice, they have made it their life's work to sing songs that speak to something ancient yet surging with relevance. In 2015, Rising Appalachia founded the Slow Music Movement to help maintain an independent musical spirit in the face of such a fast-paced world. They are creatively committed to keeping their work accessible at the local street level, as well as expanding to larger audiences abroad, and have continued to maintain autonomy by self-managing, recording, producing, and creating, and directing their own work. Welcome, Leah. We're so happy to have this opportunity to connect today. Yay, thank you for having me. Beautiful spring afternoon. Hmm. So you've been making music for 11 years now. How did Rising Appalachia get started? And how did growing up in Georgia and New Orleans influence you in your work? Yeah, the the story of origin is one of my favorites to tell. Um, It's, it kind of reads a bit like a, you know, like um, an archetypal 
what's the word I want? You can pull the what's the word I want out. Um, mm-hmm. Fable, I think, you know. Uh, Chloe and I were raised in a family full of music. So we had everything from blues and jazz, piano and, and vinyl collections that my mom and, and my dad both kept around the house to um, all the way to old time mountain music jams in the, in the living room. So we were around music at all times, but it was never something that we thought we would do um, with any professional interest. And I think it was a combination of, uh, we, we came back to Atlanta after we had both graduated from high school and traveled and I had been living in, in Latin America working alongside a lot of different social justice movements. Um, And my sister had been doing a lot of environmental work up in Northern California with the Redwood and Earth First communities. Uh, And we came back to Atlanta to record a one day project as a gift for our family. Um, Mostly just to say, you know, it worked for them to raise us with music in the home. You know, we were really grateful and we were still carrying that music. And we thought that would be it, you know. One, one afternoon we would record, we whipped it up into a little album. We thought we'd have it for the rest of our lives as a gift for, for any kind of grandkids that ever happened and, and extended family and friends. And we would play music at farmer's markets every now and then in exchange for sunflowers. And, you know, <laughs> otherwise we would keep going. We were both really very devout activists and on a different path. Um, and. And that segues a bit, uh, we continued recording. After that album was done, we were invited to perform at a really big uh, local Atlanta, kind of Celtic and Appalachian traditional concert. And we sold every copy that we had made that we thought it would last us forever. We sold them all in that one show. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that, that was surprising and, and fascinating and we had never even been on a microphone before at that time. So, so that it, it really kind of continued each step that we took, each stage that we were invited to, we would kind of grow our ideas a little bit more and grow our intention a little bit more in music. Uh, and so that was the origin. I, I would give New Orleans an enormous amount of credit for kind of setting in you know, our longer term intentions. Our, our roots were very much in, in that kind of fam, familial upbringing. And then we went down to New Orleans after, after Katrina hit, like many, many people that became invested or reinvested in the city. And we came down to New Orleans to work with a lot of our, our Louisiana friends, long-term residents and artists, and to create a, a space of catharsis with them. Um, just Just creating... Uh, performance and art spaces and a lot of the and a lot of the places that were heavily hit um, to kind of create art when everyone was really functioning and operating off of necessity and and what we thought would be about a two-week commitment ended up being about a seven-year investment in the city of New Orleans it it rocked us in a way that will will be remembering and writing about and processing forever and it, we realized that not only did New Orleans have so, so much to teach us, uh, but there was no better way to support the culture and the, the thriving musicianship and sort of the honor of, of music that that city provides than, than to be on the ground there. So we spent the next many, many years of our lives doing everything from, we recorded down there and we, we also basically had a day job as street performers and, so we would go out to the French Quarter and play every day and, and work our own music into the fabric of, of the New Orleans world. Uh, and it was, it was a, a life-altering for, I think, so many of us that were down there at that time and probably many people that New Orleans touches uh, and really brought us uh, many more layers of appreciation of, of being a musician. You know, I think in American culture, you don't, see the musician as something that's honored and in new orleans that's 
you know, there's villages literally set up for, for musicians to live and, and work together and there's studios everywhere and it's really considered the, the cultural heart of the city. could wax poetic forever about, about <laughs> those years. Yeah, it's, um, well, there's a few things that um, feel uh, unique and important about what you're sharing, but um, before I go on to kind of get into more of your path with, um, I mean, for lack of a better term, activism, but I think that that term is sort of limiting. Um, I do want to just acknowledge, um, you know, the show is called Star Seed Survival Guide, and part of what that's about is this idea that um, that there are people that are identified more with our cosmic origins, and um, some part of that journey is often a struggle with um, family of origin. And, um, and this idea of, of coming in through a bloodline that has trauma or is working out certain karmas or stories. And so, so many people have this experience of their siblings being um, <laughs> something of an obstacle to sharing their gifts freely um, because siblings can get into this thing like, well, Leah's good at music, so I have to be good at sports to have a separate identity. Um, and so it, it feels really rare to, um, to see people in this configuration of like having been sharing their gifts and having the, the sharing of their gifts facilitated by uh, a really harmonious relationship with their sibling. And so I'm just curious um, if it's always been harmonious or if you felt like you needed to overcome challenges or competition to reach this space of coordinating to share in a, a bigger, bolder way. Yeah, it's an awesome question. Um, and I'm sure that Chloe and I would answer it differently. Uh, but let's see, for me, I'm the older sibling. And so there's a few things that I feel like I had access to. Um, you know, I spent, I spent five years, six years almost before Rising Appalachia was formed, sort of sowing a lot of wild seeds and traveling internationally alone and studying under the Zapatista movement and living in rural communities in Colombia and training in India and just a lot of things that I deeply desired to do. And I think had Rising Appalachia sprung up before those things had happened, it may have been a lot more entangled uh, with, with some of mine, my own independent needs. And I think there are a few blessings in the way that it has come about. You know, one is that uh, I think both of us were able to do some of that exploring in our own ways before it began. I think secondly, we didn't ever try 
you know, I think if we had sat down and said, we want a band, we want to make it big. And there was this, you know, kind of creative angst tied to it, then there, that would also create a little more tension. But both of us for 12 years now are, are actually in awe of every step of progress that's been made and so we're not the the goal was never there so that that component of struggle also isn't there it's very fluid in the path it's taken um and and i would i would also say that although we do struggle and and work out our own interpersonal relationships and and you know whose ideas are gonna go we're gonna go with and you know sibling dynamics of all sorts we from the early days of our lives have been very very different and so we're our competitive nature is not uh is not the prominent part of our of our dynamic we we don't want the same things and we actually don't want to to operate the band in the same way and so chloe for example if she's really really thriving on <clears throat> on songwriting she does a lot of songwriting <clears throat> and i really enjoy the the sort of storytelling component and and sort of weaving together the songs on stage and so that's a place where we just stay out of each other's way um and that's that's been a really empowering part of our dynamic i think our inherent uh battle for for center or forefront in any way isn't isn't there because the things that we do best are not the same and that's i think a matter of of luck and circumstance and and horoscopes and astrology and our diets and mm -hmm. athletic proclivity and everything else so well it speaks highly of your character to be able to um come together and co-create in the name of like higher shared values and that's definitely something that we're really exploring from every angle possible right now is um for me it's um goddess in her collective form and so there are these you know um uh, older cultures who have and celebrate the multifaceted nature of goddess but that you know at the end of the day we're all like fingers on her hand or you know like different right. arms of her you know eight armed organism and um to identify more with the place where we connect than with the um the areas that we're different or um, celebrate the difference as a celebration of variety and like bringing texture and complexity to the projects that you create together. Um, that is like, like the two of, of you and your band and probably bands in general kind of represent um, a collective goddess embodied. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I think it does really, really help that the work that we do together feels much bigger than both of our personal agendas or our, our personal desires. I think that the sort of catharsis and culture building and social justice work feels like something much bigger than, than either of our individual personalities. And so that, that I think we operate and we speak a lot about our own collective and, and sort of the much more of a group mentality. And that removes the, the drama of, I think, the, the personal ego, which, which we have plenty of struggles with, but it doesn't apply quite as much to Rising Appalachia as it does to maybe other places in our lives, because it feels like it's a bigger project. And that's the blessing, I think. Yeah, I mean, the way that you're speaking about things, it just um, connects so much to these underlying philosophies of um, creative spiritual work. Um, and so I think that, the, like, you're speaking about your relationship with your sister, your band, but it really applies to, like, that's really good medicine for couples and um relationship advice i always in 
encouraging people to create an intention for the for the relationship uh, and to feel like like that if you're really going to be successful whatever successful means over a long period of time that there needs to be a sense of shared purpose because yeah. without that there's mm. nothing but the day-to-day -day stories and dramas and you will get lost in that minutia um mm. so kind of it's like an expansion into and like a building your home in the sense of shared purpose um so it yeah. explains a lot of like why it feels like your band and your movement really is is growing and gaining momentum because I think people can feel that it has harmony and integrity and is alive and want to be a part of that kind of project in some yeah. way. <laughs> yeah, I'm so thankful for it because I, I do also think the role of the artist often as broad as it is and I'm a big believer in the role of art and the artist in in social movements and in and in growth cultural growth but I think self-promotion is is a, a really challenging and exhausting thing to do and it can be much gentler if there if there is a bigger purpose it can feel there's a fluidity to it you know that I think we appreciate and also I think probably is fairly transparent to our audiences and and I think that that creates a grace that's really uh, uh, it's different than than I think what self-promotion would look like you know yeah um. So that leads me to um, one of my questions. Whenever I tune in with what you're doing, I always feel really moved by the variety of different kinds of educational events and benefits and action days that I see Rising Appalachia sharing music at. Um, and so I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about this slow music movement and um, what that means and what it's looking like these days. Yeah, um, the slow music movement came out of what we originally had just called sustainable touring. And it's, it's been because our, our story, like I explained earlier, has been first and foremost as activists and second, second I think, as performers and figuring out how to weave that together. We knew from the very beginning, if we were going to be touring, we wanted it to not be dive bars and, you know, hustling at South by Southwest to get our name in front of big music people. It just never was an uh, appeal to us. So we always wanted to figure out what a more rooted and more connected touring would look like and what it would feel like. Um, and originally that just meant sustainable touring. And a few years ago, I was invited to do a, a TEDx talk. So it's a TED talk that is supported by sort of a side, side of the TED community. And as many times as I've been on a stage, it was actually really very nerve wracking to figure out how to get something consolidated into 11 minutes from A to Z without any musical interludes. Um, and it and as i was kind of trying to piece together what to call what we do uh, that term came out of that project out of this ted talk and and i titled it the slow music movement and from there on i think it really strengthened our own ideas and principles because like anything when you give it an, a name you know it, it brings more life to it and then we had a way to explain our our hopes and our blueprint for sustainable touring uh, in a way that I think people instantly understood at least what we were going for, maybe not all of the pieces. So the nuts and bolts of the slow music movement have been very basic things like regional touring, figuring out how to not jet set and fly from one region to another region to another region every day or two, you know, that to, to really commit if we're going to tour and if we're going to have to travel a long distance to get somewhere, to be in that region long enough to, to have a relationship with, with the season there and to have a relationship with what's going on on the ground, to learn a little more about national parks in that area or nonprofits and 
And so that's a very, you know, very basic level is, is regional, regional touring. And then bringing in local food into our green rooms, into the lobbies, having uh, encouraging venues and to not have single use um, cups and silverware and products, not for us or for the audience. Um, there's some very basic things like, like that, that we're always putting pressure on the venues to support us in investigating and then and then there's some more big dream picture stuff um, we toured by train right right after we launched the slow music movement we we did an entire southeastern mid southwestern tour by by train which was amazing slow not very efficient <laughs> very very romantic you know and and much less impactful you know both in the environment and also on our psyches to to be able to travel in a way that didn't involve strip malls and gas stations but we really got to see the landscape uh, our our upcoming tour this season is by sailboat which is unbelievable <laughs> wow it's a dream come true and it's actually happening we're going to do a three-week tour, 10 miles a day or something tiny like that, but all on sailboat. Uh, so there's, there's that side of, of an exploring alternative transportation in any way and in any way that we can wrap our heads around. And we've talked about horseback riding and bike riding tours, and, and we'll see what else comes through from that. And then, like you mentioned, there's the Permaculture Action Days, which are the best, I think, of... of of all of it they take all of the ideal ideals and strategizing and kind of put it into one capsule and the permaculture action network our dear friends of ours they are an organization that works with musicians and festivals and churches and theater groups all around the country and create basically one day action days in our case after before or after one of our concerts where all of the energy that goes into the show itself then gets channeled to an urban farm and garden anywhere from two, two to 500 people show up throughout the day to put f physical energy into the ground and create a more sustainable urban farming spaces for the communities where we're playing concerts. So that's been, I think the most, just the most fully, uh, fully engaged way that we've been able to see all of those things come into one place, but it's a blueprint and we hope that it's a blueprint that gets, gets built on and, and other artists take on and add to it. And, and it can just create a, a format for alternative touring, which is not an easy way to move through the world, you know? Mm, that's, so exciting. It feels really necessary. Um, when I was growing up, I did a lot of civic theater and always felt like I needed to decide uh, whether I was going to be a performance artist or a fine artist. And I did go to art school and really go with design and fine art. Um, and a lot of why I felt that there needed to be a decision or a distinction was that being a musician like meant something really specific to me. And, um, and it, when I pictured what it would mean, it, I just pictured touring and trying to figure out the industry and trying to get um, authorities in the industry to understand my creative expression, which had historically like not, <laughs> not been very successful at getting like people with money to validate yeah. what I wanted to um, make art about. And so I really just never even tried to get, be involved in that. Cause I just, it felt like, well, it's this one way and I don't want to do it that way. Um, and it's taken me like 17 years or something to realize like there is no restriction <laughs> where yeah. I had perceived one to be and start just receiving music in my kava ceremonies or sharing more live music in my moon lodge and feeling like, how is this different? You know, I, I, I travel to different cities. <laughs> I have a small, I, I 
gather a small group of people to have an experience and that experience involves live music and um you know it it attempting to evoke a particular um, kind of experience and it's just kind of alarming to me how long it took me to feel i it was okay or give myself permission to make music just because of that paradigm or like uh of like the rock star or whatever um mm. so i think from my perspective what you're embodying um as this totally other way of of thinking about being a musician or music or the musical experience i think it's really healing for the collective psyche around you know that grew up with 80s um recording moguls and musicians like who were you know invited to become like millionaires uh, you know right, right. The, it's a weird industry <laughs> yeah it just it feels like an injury on the spirit of music and yeah. uh, that yeah that the work that you do is is addressing that um in a really abstract kind of broad band way uh, super abstract and yeah <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so, you know, back to the specifics of these, uh, the slow music movement um, and these different kinds of events that you're always popping up at and, and involving yourselves in. Um, I thought it was amazing to see that you went to Standing Rock and just wanting to hear um, a little bit about your experience there. What, what was that like? Yeah, totally. Um, we we have been involved with native sovereignty movements and empowerment movements in this country for for a while just lending our our people power and our songwriting towards really seeing the this continent address indigenous rights land rights and and food justice work and so when standing rock began we had a lot of friends and community members that were on the ground there um, and we we were sort of witnessing and watching it through their eyes and through their stories um, and I think doing some fundraising from from afar and what just watching and and assisting in in the ways that we could and uh, and as it became more and more uh, heated and and also I think kind of a, a cultural symbol for a lot of people. We we continued talking about whether it would make sense for us to go or not, um, and we decided that we wouldn't go unless we were invited because it felt really important that it was a movement that was led by the indigenous communities that were on the ground and that was led by elders and that it wasn't sort of taken on by by everyone as uh you know and or tokenized um and so we we made that decision internally and, and said it would if if the time was right and if there was an invitation we would go but we wouldn't we wouldn't just go to to sort of show up and plug in and take selfies or anything like this you know and so, um when we were invited by uh to go on thanksgiving day we were invited by the indigenous uh, international indigenous youth council and they wanted to create a concert that was all women run um, women run musicians and and all of the musicians that were invited sort of represented different walks of life different different continents different races different religions uh, and that was part of their vision to really have a the full rainbow represented all the colors and um we had about three days. We were in the middle of a tour. We had about three days. And so Chloe and I went um, by ourselves. We left the rest of the band in the Bay Area and we went alone. Um, and we questioned whether we had the emotional strength to go and whether it was the right way to show up. But it felt like that invitation could not have been more powerful. And so we said that it, you know, it, it felt like the right thing. And 
I would say that we didn't really know what we were getting into until we got on the ground, like probably many people that were there. And then being on the ground was incredibly potent and powerful and peaceful also, which I think is a part that the media really didn't, uh, didn't tell the, the peaceful side of the camps very well. Um, and I think that the archetype that was created on the ground in Standing Rock will, will be one that will last for forever and all of the minds of the people that were there that were touched by Standing Rock that there was a a movement, a protest, although I think that word is really in question, um, you know, an encampment and, and a commitment to protecting a way of life <clears throat> and a piece of land and a piece of water, a river that was truly an indigenous led movement. It was very held by the elders. There were sacred fires that were burning at all times and there were no, there were, there were no motions made without a women's council and a men's council and an elder council gathering and discussing how they wanted the Standing Rock movement to, to take a step forward or to take a step back. And I think that that in and of itself created a model that we haven't seen maybe in Western culture for a long time, certainly not in the activist movement. Um, it created a space where there was really, uh, it was a real nonviolent training and a real um, community run by, by, elder, by the elder council uh, and a respect for the elder council. So it was a, an amazing honor to be there. It was, it was an honor to witness how much that encampment had been built up. Uh, you know, really piece together everything from teepees to geodesic domes to sort of trailers pieced together with tarps and, and uh, every kind of every walk of life was really there in, in one way or another, figuring out if they could help or volunteer or show up and cook, you know, or work with the horses or do direct action. And the direct action was very well designed. There was trainings and nonviolence every day. Uh, there was legal training. So it was, people were very encouraged to, to, to be f formally, um, formally trained in nonviolence. And, and it represented in that way, I think, the civil rights movement and, and the stories of Gandhi and, and uh, in a way that I just don't, I don't know that we have seen. And, and I, I think even though Standing Rock has now gone back underground and, you know, has taken a step back from an authoritative and military presence that I'm not sure we can fight with fire. You know, I, I do think that the movement has gone underground and is re-strengthening and, and staying very connected in a way that, that, will show back up when it needs to. Um, and the, the strength of that movement, I, I believe, is still very much intact. So, oh, Thank you. It's wonderful to hear because, you know, I think it's healthy to be skeptical of anything that you see online or on the news or social media, even if it seems like... Um, oh yeah, I sort of know that person or I don't think that they would lie about this or that. There's just sort of, I, I think, a healthy skepticism um, and for me having a sense of like, well, I don't really know what happened. Um, and so I, I really only trust when it comes from, you know, face-to-face -face interactions with people who were there um, mm -hmm. and what I have heard from, you know, people like yourself and some other sisters that really spent some time out there just listening and um, it's very different than, than, than anything else that I'm hearing. And so it's, I think, important to, to um, just... <clears throat> I guess hear those voices that like you don't have any like major state like media stake in um, 
like you have no reason to lie, you know, that it was yeah. like, very peaceful. And there was a lot of very uh, methodical, organized, intelligent, um, wisdom based action happening there and modeling of a different way. And, you know, mostly I just saw a lot of a lot of pictures of, of the violence because that's what, um, you know, it's always it trying to escalate is. things and scare people and mm -hmm. you know i'm sure scare people away yeah from mm -hmm. coming yeah <laughs> and it probably worked you know i mean that's our i think our media is no even all all of our alternative media is focused so much on on sort of reporting the most extreme cases this the the highest drama the you know the one case where there's a really intense altercation and, and the media isn't really trained to tell us success stories or, or gentle stories or, or stories that don't have dramatic conclusions, but that are just, you know, pieces of, of perspective. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't, I don't think that that's, I don't think we get balanced perspective anymore from media. I think that that the old sort of folkloric version of, of storytelling is is you need to still do your due diligence there because you'll get ten different versions of, of a story. But there's some there's some truth to to that that our media really doesn't catch hold of. So oh, I'm kind of getting this vision of you know you as touring and being a part of all these different like hubs and movements and action networks um, as kind of this old world reporter you know this this like ancient <laughs> storyteller that that was perhaps like a precursor to the reporter archetype as we know it and you're kind of like there's um another version of this archetype and let's not forget about that version and let's let's bring that back or keep that aspect of the storyteller reporter archetype alive that right. these other stories that aren't being told that are happening but aren't being told and remembered yeah i like that idea <laughs> I, like, I like all the old ways but bringing them into modern context you know yeah oh well, i think you're, you're doing a great job at that because that like from you know, my perspective, your, your music feels very contemporary and ve like very um, of the moment also. So, um, you. you know, that, that bridging, um, the, that's always um, of a lot of interest to me is like people who are like being the bridge between the past and the future, you know? Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, so, you know, just curious to hear because there's so much, like, there's so many wonderful stories in your rising Appalachia universe. Just wanting to hear like a few more little, um, gems of like maybe what some of your most favorite recent off the beaten path venues that you've gotten to play at have been. Yeah, there's, there's many. Um, we... We do well. We did a wonderful. Our perm, like I said earlier, our permaculture action days are are pretty much always our favorites, and they always surprise us when we show up on the farm. Uh, and this last tour, we were in Nashville, and showed up at a beautiful woman's piece of property. She had worked, you know, fifteen years to fundraise for by like baking cookies and and babysitting and she bought this plot of land across from the home that she grew up in um, because she was kind of a godmother in the neighborhood and and two of the young boys that she loved to to spend time with and bike race and and sort of be in in older trickster council with one of them was shot in that neighborhood and she decided that she wouldn't go to the vigil um, she didn't want to go to his funeral. She wanted to do something that would ground that neighborhood out. And that at that day or that week, she started trying to figure out how to get this this old abandoned house and turn it into a community garden. And that was, I think, 15 years ago. And um, and we had met her in passing at one of the herbalist conferences, actually. And so to be on her land and to to hear her stories and have 
I, you know, 150 people on the land putting in garden beds and building a structure for an outdoor stage and a live willow fence and an entire mushroom growing section and just watching all of this get put into her long-term dream and very slow, uh, slowly brought to fruition that that property and then in this in this one day it was really able to get some good love and tending and that was that was a powerful thing to be a part of and celebratory really and and to feel like we could make an impact that would that would take six months or longer for for a small group of people to be able to do that kind of work in a garden and and with that many hands and that many people helping lead the charge, uh, we were able to really, to really put some roots in. I mean, no pun intended. So that was a really super powerful day. And the Permaculture Action Day model just continues to, to be very inspiring, almost overwhelming for us. Hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm really getting this, um, this like strong archetypal presence like i maybe i could just go out on a limb and say like um a spirit guide that you might have that is like this huntress for <laughs> the for the the stories um of life happening in a sustainable way so maybe it's it's um I see a lot of people that are, are more in like a, a builder archetype that's more about like the structure and the building blocks and the foundational pieces and like building up the structure that creates sustainability. And it feels like, you know, maybe you're doing that too. I don't know, but like really getting this strong feeling of this feminine way of, of, of finding the sustainability already happening and just making sure that that's brought to consciousness um so that like humanity can can be conscious of its goodness yeah yeah i i like that idea i i think my brain and my spirit have always worked that way i do much better at recycling than at sort of creating something from scratch if i have a blank canvas i like really kind of panic mm. but if there's something that's already there then i do i really enjoy figuring out how to bring it bring it forward i haven't ever thought about that as in the activist role you know but i i feel like that's the way that i move in so many other ways mm. that that's an interesting observation i like that it's idea. really beautiful um just having like a moment of celebration that that you exist and are operating in that way because for me it's more inspiring <laughs> to learn that the most you know cherished beliefs and needs i have for what's possible um in terms of like living harmoniously with the earth and with the ecosystems that we're part of um to have it be like i'm in this space of like passionately believing that it's possible and supporting people who also believe it's possible and are working hard to build that in spaces where it doesn't exist like it still it's a lot it feels still feels like a lot of hard work and um a, a lot of of struggle and effort is needed to get from where we are to where this other place and so like when i hear you talk it's like it opens up this whole new or just like gentler the word you've used a couple times but gentler way of exploring these ideas that says like you know notice the beauty yeah. that already is around you and allow yourself to to feel that and receive from that be energized by that and inspired by that and that feels a lot more sustainable long term like on the body and on the heart than being like in the the battlefield of you know fighting for the earth yeah for sure <sighs> just that language even <sighs> battlefield yeah 
I think we have to do some reclaiming of our of our words, you know, because I I do think the the idea of fighting feel I mean it just creates that it creates that feeling in the body. Even if you're fighting for the sea turtles or you're fighting for you know, you're, it's still it 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 has that resonance in the body. So mm. I think there's a lot of, of ideas around how to reclaim our languaging, you know, that 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 will contain those those sentiments. But, you know, the activist burnout is so real, mm-hmm. and I, I I'm I really believe in our in our inherent goodness. I think as a people and as society, and and it feels different to sort of be mining for goodness as opposed to. Mm about being on a battlefield oh i love that yeah my mining for goodness <laughs> That's... reclaiming the mining term too I suppose. <laughs> hmm. yeah it's um i kind of think of it like i don't know i'm getting this picture of like um like pigs snuffling in the dirt for truffles or something that yeah. you know that you just doing something that feels good in order to experience something else that also is yummy <laughs> and um, that that's, um, it's a, it's a good way to be. <laughs> yeah. Stacking functions. <laughs> yeah. And that, you know, the end result is, I, I don't know. On the one hand, I feel like there's this part of me that wants to go like, look, it's equally powerful. But then there's another voice that, that feels more true that comes in that goes, it's not equally powerful. It's much more powerful. Yeah. Uh, and that it might not be um, in the immediately quantifiable results equal or more powerful, but because it's not about immediate results. It's about the long term. Totally. Big picture. <laughs> Totally. I mean, that's like what we all learn in herbalism. I imagine as well as, you know, the, the preventative medicine is not as, as dramatic, but it creates a foundation that is a lot healthier than, than, you know, very strong Western medicines, which can eradicate a problem, but also leave you with a whole slew of new problems. Mm-hmm. I, I love the subtle. I like the subtle, the subtle across the board. You know, it's it's a it's a, it's a much more of a long haul approach. Mm-hmm. And you know, I always think this to myself. I don't know that I've actually ever really said it, but so I'm just going to take the opportunity to say it now that. Nice. Um, part of my role in in like speaking to certain dynamics like it's first and foremost um speaking to parts of myself um so i'm really aware as like a quadruple aries person of how easy it is for me to get um enticed or seduced into like um some big dramatic radical um display or say something in a way like use words in such a way that escalates the feeling of urgency around something um Mm -hmm. and that everything that i study like herbalism um or daily spiritual practice it's all to balance out my natural (laughs) impulse to (laughs) "Ah!" um and um ground into and remind 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 me um of nature's timeline and um the power or um strength or long longevity of operating on nature's timeline so people will say like that whatever their particular spiritual practice is it's just the reminders that they most need to hear and yeah. so like my path with plant medicine is very much just like the plants are the, the best at reminding me um, right. to come back to um, this other creative process that's available. Um, that's not so much like <laughs> pour gasoline, light match. Um, totally. <laughs> that is also available to me um, that 
is hard on the body and hard on the nervous system and is adrenaline fueled and can seem momentarily indicated or effective, but ultimately leads to me crying myself to sleep. <laughs> so. yeah. And I think we're all kind of adrenal fatigued. I mean, it's like the nature of our culture. Yeah. And most people that are drawn to activism are, are drawn to, you know, the extremism of it because it feels like an extreme situation. I try hard not to be angry sometimes by a culture stuck now in living entwined by so many systems these failing systems this prison system is so uncaring and this nation sends the most of its own citizens to jail imagine one in 100 and some without bail and what kind of crime could possibly entail locking away so many poor people without fail now there's criminalizing of races with fear now cops are making folks disappear there's a malfunction of justice denied while big businesses are trying to hide under the mask of protection as disguise under the mask of protection now why can't we rehabilitate now why can't we put more stock in faith and i try hard not to be angry sometimes i believe in the goodness of humankind is to just stand up and redefine that inner grace that lies in each of us confined and i believe in the magic of self and what happens if you get up off that shelf your dusty dreams and undo any unjust that's been done to you and you stand firmly graced by your right to the sun stand firmly graced now you stand firmly graced by your right to the sun stand firmly graced now I, I always loved my, the woman that I studied yoga with when I was in India. She is an amazing, amazing teacher. And, and she said, yeah, I, I have this very same personality dynamic. You know, I want the fast and the fiery and the biggest. And I've also kind of trained myself to at least be aware of that and question it. Um, and she said, you, you know, we were talking about yin yoga and I said, Oh, it's just boring. I don't want to, you know, I want the thing that's going to fire me up. And she said, usually the people who are the least drawn to that layer of subtlety, to that sort of slower and more mindful practice are the ones that need it the most. Mm. And I thought, <laughs> thought about that for years, you know, just how quick I was to be like, it's just too boring for me. <laughs> kind of get schooled really quick. Like, Oh, I'm probably calling myself out a little there. You know? so, <laughs> yeah. It's a long process to understand ourselves. Mm. Yeah. And, and just kind of, I guess, maybe try different um, approaches. Is what it, what it always leads me to try different approaches to, um, I mean, really the ultimate thing, it's not like even activism to me. It's just to different approaches to embodying like to having the things that my spirit cares about, like show up in the world at all. <laughs> uh, like, so it's sort of like for there to be a point of having a body. Um, Cause if it was enough to just kind of like, you know, perceive beauty or feel love or whatever, then like, why would we come here? <laughs> um, Cause it's so, it's so hard to have a body so, and expensive. Uh, <laughs> Laborious. Yeah. And so like what motivates me to try these different approaches, even maybe when I'm kind of like, it feels boring or, or hard or whatever is just kind of being like, well, you know, like, is what you're doing like or is your natural tendency like producing the effect that you would like it to have you know it's like real simple and abstract and just like well like if it's not like or it's not feeling good um then just try something different and right. you know like maybe you that goes against your identity or whatever and you're like oh gosh am i really the sort of person who like for me it was like <laughs> Uh, am I the kind of person who like 
travels around teaching at festivals. <laughs> like that was like an idea that I just, it wasn't part of my identity. And so it felt like unappealing to me. And then it was just like, you know, who cares whatever your idea of the thing is, just um, try it differently and see if it helps you feel more expressed, really. Right. right. It doesn't, it never looks the way we plan it to look ever. No yeah. matter. <laughs> um, so we're going to have to start closing out, but I did want to ask as a, a final question um, and, you know, cause it really, the, thing that has brought us together um, from my perspective is this alignment of values and alignment of creative processes around like what's making sense for how to share, why to share our art and how to share our art and what kinds of environments and that we're both kind of maybe coming to this idea of creating more of our own events um, versus yeah. traveling around to other people's events and participating and collaborating in that way. Um, so I loved the um, event that you shared with me um, that's coming up at the end of April. So I would love to just hear more about this um, civic resistance and regenerative, regenerative culture um, experience that you're offering. Yeah, it's an, um, yes, it's really exciting for me. It's a pilot program. So it's the first time it's being offered, but Basically, uh, our ideas have always been around creating events, eventually, where people come to us instead of us coming everywhere. And um, I think that's probably where many people arrive to after lots of travel. Um, so a couple of friends that are very amazing, very radical kind of homesteader folks um, that are dear friends of mine. We got together post-election and just started strategizing about how to keep people feeling engaged and empowered. I feel like a lot of panic has entered our political and national dialogue. Um, and I know that panic creates rigidness and rigidness creates a shutdown mechanism to happen. So we wanted to create an event that we eventually have renamed but originally we were calling the anti-apocalypse training skill <laughs> to, to create a space where it, there was teaching and dialogue about tools that created just personal empowerment you know it, it again it doesn't have to be a giant sort of unsurmountable mission but just personal empowerment um so the program that we started is called weaving threads of change and the first round of it is going to be at the end of April in Atlanta, Georgia, which is my hometown, my home, big, beautiful, giant city. Um, and the idea also of bringing regenerative and sustainability skills into cities, um, because I, I am a real big believer that if everyone that gets exposed to permaculture and radical farming practices goes out and buys 10 acres, then we're not gonna have any more wild spaces. And if instead we bring uh, urban practices, regenerative practices, sustainability practices, rooftop gardening and, and community gardens into all of our big mega metropolis areas, then we have a real potential to impact large scale change. Um, so the first program that we wanted to do is in Atlanta and it's bringing a lot of the very powerful teachings of homesteading and everything from wild food and uh, how to identify north and south and east and west without a compass and without your iPhone and, uh, you know, creating a space where people are learning about backyard herbalism. So knowing what's available within urban and even suburban areas, practical first aid, um, is being taught and also mindfulness and yoga practices, personal physical practices, very basic ways to have a relationship with the body and to be able to have within the body uh, innate knowing and trust and, and confidence in the way that our bodies are moving and our tools. Um, and there's civic engagement 
So we look at it almost as a three-tier program. You have uh, practical, physical skills for sustainable, herbal, urban living. And then more metaphysical, spiritual, even martial arts-based body practices. And then the third tier is civic engagement. So really clear incentive about how to have a relationship with the governing bodies that we are under the uh, <laughs> oppressive forces of and how to have a relationship with them so they don't just feel like overwhelming, overarching uh, industry which which they are you know and and i don't know that that it's about having faith in big politics as much as it's about feeling empowered that you understand where your leverage is within big politics and how to have an impact on local city city council issues or public school conversations or where the next you know roadblock might show up um, and how to have those relationships if, if you want them. I feel like those are tools that we're not, all of those are tools that we're not taught, you know, or the same way that we might be taught economics or, or algebra. We're not really taught those tools. And so our hope is just to create a, a weekend long intensive event that gives all three of those studies ways of life some some time and some energy we have teachers that are coming from all across the southeast um, and it's going to be held in a community run cooperative workspace um, and it's again like i said it's a blueprint to create educational weekends kind of mini i like to think of it almost as a mini learning festival really education being the primary focus more than than festivity but there will also be evening events and concerts and poetry readings and keynote speakers um, so it's this idea of taking these different walks of life these different walks of of social justice and and activism and creating a place where they're in relationship with one another and being offered in city spaces where that those tools are not as easily accessible mm. well that sounds really amazing and i'm just going to be bold and put out an intention to perhaps help you bring um something like that to the west coast in the future of that if that's of interest to you because yeah. everything that you're talking about it's very much like what i i feel to be most needed is that that reskilling and even in the context of like i can go into the like well because what if the apocalypse and then i kind of something wiser in me kind of says like just do it for your own empowerment. Just do it like to feel confident in your own skills, whatever life throws at you. Uh, yeah. And that the different pieces of what you're offering, it just feels like such a compliment to like, to what I would most, I feel most called to be sharing. So in my perspective, our apprenticeship would maybe appeal to people who are part of these communities um, with that are reskilling in these ways and having these kind of conversations and maybe they're already a community member and they already know what their contribution is such as like I'm the village acupuncturist or something and that in this way of kind of creating our own villages and what that means that maybe the acupuncturist would understand that from their the position of their offering they they have an opportunity to tend to people's bodies and hearts and spirits who are doing this work that you know that does yeah. it has an impact on our heart it has an impact on our body has an impact on our spirit and so like you know my call is kind of like to all the people who who are coming to your trainings and your programs and uh and feel that they're the place that they would like to have it in their community is somebody who tends more to the spirit and the psychology and the the health 
of the collective soul um, that they would learn tools and practices and, and self-care and ways of working with plants and ways of bringing in ritual for people who are living together in this way. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm just really moved and excited to learn like where this conversation went and hear like really the flavor of what you're offering because I'm like, oh my gosh, I, I want to go. Yeah. Uh, and I want everybody who, like I want all of my students to go and yeah. maybe, you know, maybe we can make that happen somehow. Oh. Did you want to share um, where online people can find more information and uh, when that's going to be happening? Yes, here's the postcard. It's called Weaving Threads of Change. Um, and, and actually, the easiest way to find it as Luddite as it is, is to Google search Weaving Threads of Change, Wild Abundance. Okay. Um, but you can also find it on our Rising Appalachia um, Facebook page. It's tagged at the top of the page as, as our next upcoming event. Um, and you can also find it at the Wild Abundance webpage, which is just wildabundance.net. Um, and it's co-produced by myself and Natalie Bogwalker, who is the founder of the Firefly Gathering in Western North Carolina, which is another amazing gathering worth looking up. Uh, the first one is going to be April 28th through 30th in Atlanta, Georgia at the Elevator Factory. Uh, and you can also find information on my Instagram page, which is Leah Song Music. So it's spread all over the social <laughs> media world. Awesome. Um, thank you so much. Thank um, you so much. I really enjoyed our conversation today. Just wanting to close with, by extending a formal thank you to you, Leah. And yeah, thanks for having me and gathering all the good time and questions. <laughs> Oh, you're welcome. And thank you to all the benevolent beings and all the realms that have gathered here with us today to inspire and direct the flow of this ritual conversation. We dedicate any merits accumulated through this work to the benefit of all sentient beings. May all beings be healthy. May all beings be well. May all beings know joy and not suffer. Jema, amen, namaste, blessed be, aho. May it be finished in beauty. Rushing is violence, and so is your silence when it's rooted in compliance. To stand firm in loving defiance, make art your alliance, give voice to the fire. Move people to the beat of the wind, gather yourself and begin to dance the song until it ends. We are winners, champions of the light, forming in numbers and might. Keep the truth close in sight, and woman, medicine man. Walking with grace, I know your face and I trust your hands. Medicine woman, medicine man. Walking with grace, I know your face and I trust your hands. Find your teachers in the voice of the forest. Some plug you can't ignore this wisdom of the voiceless. Remedies are bountiful and surround us From the garden to the farthest Prayer made of stardust Find your healing in the music that calls you The voice that enthralls you What do you belong to? Eyes out, there's the setting of the sun Give thanks to each and every one The lesson is the medicine woman Medicine man Walk in with grace I know your face and I trust your hand Medicine woman, medicine man Walk in with grace, I know your face and I trust your hand
trip back into the messages in action. The art is beating, stops dark, the disbelieving, cause the garden holds the shards, the medicine is in the seeds. When we hold tight to our right to protect them, we know our might is tenfold in connection. Our elders hold them bright lights, we protect them. The medicine is evident, the wolf, the hawk, the bear clan. We hold tight to our right to protect them. We know our might is tenfold in connection. Our elders hold them bright lights, we protect them. The medicine is evidence, the wolf, the hawk, the medicine woman, medicine man. Walk in with grace, I know your face and I trust your hands. Medicine woman. 